Aloha, my name is Elaine Galland and I'm your host of Books, Books, Books. It's a live streaming series through Think Tech Hawaii. And in this segment, we're gonna discuss everything about reading books, writing books and everything in between. Today is no exception. I have a special guest with us today and he has written two books in particular that we're interested in. And that is Molokai and Daughter of Molokai. And our author is Alan Berent. The title of our show today is Stories of Heartbreak and Triumph of Kalau Papa. Alan, welcome to Books, Books, Books. Hi, How are nice you? Good, good. Nice to be here. Aloha. Aloha. One of the biggest things that um, when I was talking to people about your two books, which have been successes for, for quite some time, is what, it, what is your interest in Hawaii that that makes you that has you feeling so connected to these islands and secondly in particular to Molokai and the stories that are held there well I've been visiting Hawaii ever since uh for the first time in 1980 uh and I fell in love with it uh on on first sight I I walked off the uh, stairway onto the tarmac at the old Maui airport and I smelled uh, uh, the scent of uh, plumeria carried in on the trade winds and uh, I was in love. And I came back at least once a year. We, I live in California, so it's easy to come back fairly often. And at the same time that I was you know, coming here for vacations, I was also buying uh, books about Hawaii, about its culture, so history, sociology, uh, mysticism, uh, because I, I was fascinated by the people, by the culture, by the music, but I didn't actually ever think about writing anything set in Hawaii uh, until 1997 when I wrote a pilot for NBC, which was for a supernatural series that was going to be set in Hawaii. Uh, they didn't pick it up, but it got me started thinking about writing another novel, uh, uh, writing a novel rather instead of a, 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 a TV script that probably would never see the light of day. So I had in mind. Uh, a contemporary novel set on Molokai, uh, which my wife and I had uh, visited uh, about five years before. Uh, and I found it a, a, a remarkably beautiful island uh, and unique even for Hawaii in that they, 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 the residents cared passionately about keeping it undeveloped. Um, you know, the, 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 the saying goes that you can drive from one part of uh, one tip of of Molokai to the other without ever encountering a stoplight, and it's true. And uh, and I learned just how passionate they are about that, and and, and really why. Uh, and so I started to think about this novel, which would be sort of about, about the bonds of community in this uh, some exotic locale. Uh, uh, the more though that I researched Molokai, the more I learned about Kalapapa. And the more I learned about Kalapapa, the more I realized, well, this is the ultimate story about the bonds of sacrifice, the bonds of community uh, in, in a community. And it just became a passion. The more I read about it, the more I thought, my God, this is this was so unjust. And it's so, at that time at least, it was so little heard of uh, on the mainland. Um, a lot of the stuff surprised me, and I'd been coming to California for 20, uh, from California for 20 years. Uh, and I thought, well, if it surprised me, it'll surprise readers too. So I just um, started off going to the uh, Hawaii State Archives uh, in Honolulu and uh, asked to see their uh, uh, their research on Kalapapa, and uh, that started. Um, uh, they, they, they wheeled in a library cart with four shelves stacked on both sides and said, "Here, here's the first folder." You finish with this, we'll give you the next one. Oh. And that ended about two years later. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I empathize with you on the mysticism and the beauty of Molokai because I can look right at my window and stare at it all day if I want to. And it is a beautiful island and it does beckon you to come and or or at least to come and understand what happened. A lot of people do know about Father Damien and Sister Marian Cope, but they don't know the heartbreak that the people had who were abandoned there. And, and I use the word abandoned, you don't use it in your novel, uh, I don't recall, but they're alienated and they're, and they're left there to survive on their own with what the, the, the church will, will provide them. 
how did that affect you when you when you were there when you when you went and visited and you were doing your research and you were talking to people i assume there were some survivors still oh oh yes at the time that i went there were probably about 100 uh, patients uh, still residents still uh, alive i think today that figure is down to below 10 uh, there's uh, there's more staff than there are residents now but uh, uh, it, it came home for me when i opened up that first uh, um, older of uh, stuff I call it from the uh, Hawaii file, uh, state archives files. And the very first letter that I found was a letter from one of the very first patients sent to Kalapapa or Kalawao actually in those days to uh, the Board of Health in 1866. And it just read, um, Please uh, uh, take pity on your humble, you know, uh, uh, servants, the lepers. Uh, we have need of a water cask. Please send us a water cask so that we may be able to uh, uh, to gather water more, more, you know, better. And I thought, oh my God, they really were just dropped here without any kind of 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 thing to 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 try to survive with. Um, and uh, I. Sometimes even jumped off the boat, am I correct? Pardon me? Sometimes even pushed right off the boat. Am, am no, I... that's an old myth. That, that's I, an old myth? That would be the cattle myth. or something? The cattle were pushed off, uh, <laughs> off uh, that way. The, all of the, uh, the patients were taken in by rowboats. Um, but the, uh, the cattle, unfortunately did have to, did have to swim to shore and at least one of them turned around and was headed toward Honolulu last time anybody saw. <laughs> Tell me about Rachel, your main, your main character in Molokai. Tell me about Rachel and her story. Well, Rachel, we first meet her when she's a um, five, six year old uh, girl, uh, native Hawaiian living in Honolulu. Her father is a merchant seaman. Um, and she is uh, 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 one, one day discovers a rash on her, on her arm uh, and her mother uh, knows what it is uh, because she's heard this before and she does her best to use uh, goes with the local kahuna to try to get him to uh, make it go away and it works for a little while and then it comes back and and ultimately she's diagnosed with uh, leprosy now what would later become Hansen's disease and she is taken from her family um, brought to the Kalihi receiving station where she is uh, imprisoned and uh, poked at and prodded at by scientists for uh, uh, for a year or so before she is uh, taken to Molokai. And without her parents, uh, without anyone except an uncle who she knows is at, at Kalopapa. And to, and to me, this was just the most terrifying thing that I could imagine happened to me as a child. And the fact that it did happen to children to be ripped away from their families and taken uh, to some strange new place like this, um, uh, it, it, it was mind boggling. And then when I had read about how the children of the patients were often taken away from them for, to, to, try to, pro, to pro, prevent them from uh, coming down with leprosy uh, because it's not a genetic disease. It's, a, it's, it's one from close contact. I thought, well, that's it. This is, has to be the story of a young girl taken away from her family as a child who grows up, finds someone to love, marries, has a child, and then has her family taken away from her. It's and the almost like the story repeated itself with daughters of Mal daughter of Malachi, right? Because Ruth is taken away. That's right. That's right. And I didn't actually plan that before I started writing Molokai. I, uh, I, I wasn't that smart, but as I started my research and I realized, well, I wanted Ruth to go someplace farther outside of the island. So it would be harder for Rachel to track her down. And I, I, I knew that a lot of Japanese farmers went to California in the early 20th century. And the more I worked out the math, I realized, oh my God, uh, she would have been in turn. And yes. it just, it was serendipity. It just, it just clicked into place that they would both. I'd like to point out that in Daughter of Molokai, you're very good about, you know, listing the names of the camps, what happened in those camps, mm -hmm. um, the struggle that they had, the Utagawas, not the, yeah, the, no, Watanabe's had when they went 
there to try and start farming and growing strawberries and the things that went on land-wise between the uh, Californian landowners and the Japanese that came over. Mm -hmm. And not only that, another heartache was the fact that the Japanese family that adopted Ruth suffered some consequence as well. They were they could have been shunned as well, right? Yes, they uh, uh, they could have been shunned, uh, and and uh, ultimately where they wound up shunned just for the fact of their 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 simple Japanese ness. Um, and uh, uh, all of the all of the things that happened. I mean. The two books have, you know, are, are kind of companion tales to each other. They they're complementary. They together they form one big overarching story. And the thing that they both have in common is that the characters of Rachel, everything that happens to her in that book as a Hansen's disease patient is something that really happened to somebody somewhere. Uh, and the same is true of Ruth as someone who is interned. Everything that she experiences is something that happened to somebody during that time. So I don't, I, I have an armature of truth that the character is based on, and then I just superimpose a fictional character on top of that. Yes, well, I, I believe your readership is probably very happy that you did write Daughter of Molokai, because you do end up wondering at the end of Molokai, what happened to Ruth? What was Ruth's fate in all of this, right? Here she is the daughter of a leper, uh, father and mother, Charles Kenji, what, uh, what was his last name? Charles Chen Kenji? Udagawa. Uh, Udagawa. Udagawa. That's where the Udagawa comes in. And he had leprosy too. What a good man he was, by the way. Um, but, but also Rachel was a lovely, lovely person, loving, loving, loving people. Uh, and their daughter's taken away from them. So Ruth has that stigma about her. And then the Japanese uh, family, the Watanabes adopt her. And they are then stigmatized for having adopted a, a, a child of leprosy, a child that is the, the union of a leprous family couple. Uh, not, not so much uh, for, uh, for that, although there is a subplot there about why they chose to adopt somebody from Kalapapa. Um, uh, but uh, they, they find that, that she experiences, Ruth experiences um, uh, prejudice because she is part Hawaiian. Uh, she's not purebred Japanese, and so uh, uh, boys that she is, you know, interested in, their parents say, "No, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't be involved with her. She's a, she's a, you know, a half breed." Uh, yes. So, so there are levels. I I, the point I think I was trying to make was how far-reaching leprosy was mm -hmm. into the healthier society, and how frightened by it everybody truly was. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, it, you dedicate the, your book to Edgar and. Uh, Charlotte Whitmar, <laughs> then you call them your Ohana, and you also dedicated it to the people of, Ka of Kalapapa. So I assume they are well represented here? Um, I, you know, my, my Ed, Edward and Charlotte uh, uh, Whitmer were my uh, uh, grandparents, and, uh, ah. and I, a, a great a great pair of grandparents too, and uh, uh, Uncle Uncle Eddie was um, somebody who I was frequently in touch with when I was writing my um, uh, my book Palisades Park, which was set in in New Jersey. But uh, I I had previously I had dedicated my book previous to Molokai to my parents, and it seemed right that I should dedicate this to uh, Eddie and Charlotte, because at that time they were the only real family that I had left. And, um, and that was what Kalapapa was all about, family, Ohana. Yes, well, I thought I stumbled onto something really not known before. <laughs> but I guess it was because, you know, no one knows that they're your grandparents. But the people of Molokai, I'm sure were very very helpful and um, we're with you all the way. Um, one of the little heartbreaks in, in talking about the far reaching side of leprosy is, is Henry, Ruth's I mean, uh, um, Rachel's father. He was a mariner, he, he loved the high seas and he wrote to her and I, I have the quote right here. It says, um, if I had one wish that God could grant me, it would be to come to Molokai to live out the rest of my life, my days with my little girl. But since that won't happen, I might as well sail the globe as I always have. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, another heartbreak for Rachel, right? That's her father. Yeah, it's a heartbreak for him too. But at yeah. that at that point in the history of the uh, the settlement, they were no longer allowing uh, relatives to, uh, to to come as uh, uh, kokua, um, uh, the uh, helpers. Uh, it used to be that, uh, that, uh, that a mother could accompany a child, a, pa- a parent could accompany a child, some relative or a friend, uh, but they slowly did away with that uh, because they realized, as they discovered that inevitably those people also came down with the disease. So, uh, so the, unfortunately, Henry would love to have moved there, but he, he simply wasn't allowed by the authorities. Let's talk about some of the triumphs because there really were some triumphs and a lot of love that was on the island for each other in this colony. One of the funniest, or no, well, not funny, but one of the most wonderful nights in the book is when the girls steal out of the of the of their <laughs> of the, where they're staying and they go to a dance in. Um, oh, how, how, let's see, where was it? I have to find. It. Yes, thank you, Kakakuna. Uh, I still didn't say it right. Dog got it. But anyway, Tanaka Kai. Thank you. And they sneak out like so many teenagers sneak out of houses and they climb up the poly and they get all muddy and they get to this dance and they get to dance with a boy. How precious is that? Uh, is that something that happened? Is that in the records that you found? You know, the record of it that I found was one that uh, I found at the uh, the little museum and gift shop at Kalapapa uh, that they've established. Uh, I did not see this in a book, in a newspaper article, in a biography. At the museum, they had a picture of the poly, and under it was a caption that read, many were the Saturday nights when uh, uh, um, uh, local re- residents would climb over the po- uh, poly to attend a party at Kanakakai. Yeah. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, I can use that. And in fact, I got a whole chapter out of it. Uh, and and yeah. as you say, it's it's one of the more exhilarating um, uh, chapters in the book. I agree. Uh, I agree. It brings a smile to your face. It's like, wow, relief for these people, right? There's this, they're, they're being kids. They get to be children. And um, just to keep the dog, too, which is quite fun. I don't want to give anything away, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's a lot of wonderful things in here. Some of the people were cured and they had a choice to leave. Tell us about that. Well, the disease uh, uh, ultimately uh, took a, a, a 180 degree turn when the sulfa drugs were discovered in the 1940s. And uh, very quickly uh, after administrating these, ju- these, these drugs, within about six weeks, uh, it reduced the levels of the bacillus that causes leprosy to non-contagious levels. Now, it didn't do anything for the physical effects that uh, occurred, like when you have lepromatous leprosy, which were the tubicles that are on people's faces, or the uh, the contracture of their hands into claws because the, the bones were resorbed. It couldn't fix that. So a lot of people were in their mind, they, they, they felt disfigured and they didn't want to go out into the world again and have people stare at them. Some of them did and they were stared at and so and they came back ultimately. Um, but a few, a few actually had uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the desire to know, I'm, I want to go back out there. I want to, you know, what the world that was denied me. And, and if there is one person that Rachel is based on, you know, to some extent, uh, it's a woman named Margaret Zamora, who was uh, written about in a book called Margaret of Molokai by Mel White. And uh, she was a Portuguese uh, uh, woman who was sent there as a teenager, who was ultimately cured, went back to Honolulu, <clears throat> and she did experience some prejudice because she was physically disfigured uh, by leprosy, but she didn't let that stop her. Uh, she made friends. Uh, she became part of a, uh, uh, an information campaign where she would talk to audiences, to children, to schools about leprosy, about the effects of it, how anybody could get it. There was nothing, you know, particularly different about the people who had it, and there was nothing to fear about them. And she just struck me as having the most courageous and outgoing spirit that I thought that I'm going to give that to Rachel when the time comes for her to leave. 
And That's uh, wonderful because these were real people. They were real people, right? With real lives. Um, we have some questions in the chat room too, but I, uh, before I ask the first one, I wanted to ask, mention that there was also some good things that happened in Daughter of Molokai in these internment camps, how the people came together and looked out after each other. Mm -hmm. And they, you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah, it was it, it was it was a very similar experience. I mean, if the uh, the people in uh, Molokai uh, uh, Kalapapa rather were drawn together by a shared sense of uh, of Ohana, um, the Japanese Americans and Japanese nationals at uh, Manzanar were brought together by uh, a common uh, uh, Japanese culture and by a common American culture. The, most of these people thought, thought of themselves as Americans and they didn't understand what they were doing there, but they, they made the best of it. You know, they, uh, uh, they had uh, sports teams, uh, softball teams, uh, they, they loved baseball. Uh, they uh, uh, did, made dances, they had shows, uh, whatever they could to give themselves a sense of, of normalcy. And, 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 to, and to me, that's really the triumph of both Kalapapa and Manzanar and the other internment camps is that they were, these people were, were dealt a cruel injustice and, and imprisoned against their will and against all reason. Uh, and yet they came out of it uh, if not stronger, then no worse than they had before, because they had the they had the inner strength and they had the community to to keep them going. I think that's what makes the book so beautiful, you know, to read that they overcome such adversity. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the first uh, question from the chat room from Bonnie McChrystal. Why write Molokai from a woman's perspective, and how did you do it with such authority? <laughs> um, <laughs> To the second part of the question, first, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I, I write people, and and some people are men, and some people are women, and I start from the ground up, and I I th think about okay, where are they born? What are the influences? What are their par parents like? And by the time you do that, you wind up stacking up, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know the the coordinates of a character, and um, uh, and and if I'm if I'm true to that, I I find the the gender works itself out. Uh, and as for why I chose a woman, it was exactly for uh, what I alluded to earlier. It seemed to me when I found out that the children were taken away from them, I knew I had to write a story of a, a, a mother-daughter story. Doing it as a father-son story just didn't seem like it had quite the pathos that, that a mother-daughter story would. So that's what I wrote. Very good. RH, I don't know who that is. Is the found marriage license that what started you thinking about writing the story? That was actually towards the end of the novel in Molokai. You found a marriage license. Is oh, I'm, you're going to have to refresh yeah. me because it's it's been so long since I've read. Yeah, I think it, I think it was when uh, I think it was regarding Dorothy, the marriage license of Dorothy and her husband, maybe. Oh, oh, the yes. Marriage license I remember in the novel. Yes, that's right. She uses it as a way of uh, of tracking down um, uh, tra tracking down her sister. Uh, yeah, that that came later. It did. It didn't start out my my research. It was just as I was, you know, researching the beats of the story uh, that came up as you know the most logical way for Rachel to be able to track her down. Right. Right. The big records. Helen Weiss asks, "What did it feel like to be at Kalau Papa and see everything, especially the burial grounds and the church, to actually feel it?" It's it 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 just feels like a very safe like sacred ground. Um, when you go there, you are you know I was part of a tour and it's a very escorted tour. They don't let you get too close to the pally. I'm not sure why, uh, but there are places you can go and places that you don't go. But you you, you go there. The, I came in from the um, the airport and I came in on the bus into town and. On one side, I saw uh, the left side of the, uh, the bus, I saw a beautiful little town like any town in Hawaii. And on the other side of the town, I saw acre after acre of tombstones. And nothing said Palo Papa more vividly than that. Yeah. yeah. It did take a toll. That, that is for certain. There's a couple of things that I want to mention that I actually, little tidbits that I really like that you give the recipe for poi, kind of, sort of. <laughs> 
<laughs> kind of, sort of. <laughs> you mentioned Love's Bakery. Oh my oh. goodness. Uh, Love's um, Bakery. Love's <laughs> How do you do something that's happened during that era, era and not mention Love's Bakery? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I love the details that you give of the Japanese camps, particularly at Tool Lake. Mm -hmm. yeah, very important. The mention of Kaha Huloa, home of Maui's best banana bread and cream pies. <laughs> <laughs> you sold over 600,000. Well, there's more than 600,000 copies in print of Molokai. And... We don't know the number on, on the daughter of Molokai, but I'm sure it's six, six digits as well. How does that make you feel as an author? Well, it's very gratifying. Uh, it, uh, the sales on Molokai took, it took place over a period of about 20 years. So I never landed on the New York Times bestseller list because I never sold enough copies in one week. But it was something actually more remarkable than that. It was people discovering the book through word of mouth. Uh, starting with book clubs, uh, especially in Northern California, who said, hey, this is a great book and let's read this. And one book club passed it on to another and another and another. And it sort of took off spontaneously. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of rare because in this, in this era of books that are uh, uh, fueled by, you know, million dollar publicity pub budgets, uh, you know, I had no publicity budget for, uh, for, for, for Molokai when it was first published. Uh, I had to go out there and hustle on my own and uh, to have it discovered by readers uh, and, and kept alive by readers 20 years later uh, is, is really quite remarkable and I'm very humbled by it. Well, we're very happy that you wrote these books. I should mention you're a screenwriter, a playwright, an Emmy Award winner, and also Nebula Award winner. Congratulations. I'd like to thank you for joining us today, Alan. I so appreciated talking with you. Um, I'd like to thank the staff at, at um, Think Tech Hawaii, Jay Fidel, who keeps us all straight, um, the patrons who, who support us, the, the viewers that watch us and, and partake in our show, and the people who send in questions. It's been a pleasure, Alan. Thank you so very much. Mahalo for having me. Mahalo and aloha.